All right, I think we'll get started here. Uh, I'm Matt, the Chief Meteorologist at WeatherLogics, and I'll just be the host today. I won't be presenting, but uh, just a few housekeeping items before we get started with the two presentations today. Uh, just a reminder for everyone to be in attendance to when you have to be here at the end of the question session, uh, so at the end of both, pre both presentations. Uh, we're recording this these two presentations today to be posted on YouTube later. And uh, if you have any questions throughout the presentations, please uh, feel free to post in the chat. Uh, so there should be a chat button or chat option that you can post in. And then we'll uh, get through as many questions as we can by the end of the two presentations. But other than that, I think that's all. Thanks everyone for coming. I'll just introduce the first speaker, Jen Sabarin. Uh, so Jen is driven by curiosity and has a passion for science and education. Along with her husband, Brunel, she is a partner in Antara Agronomy Services, where her primary role is research manager. Antara launched their own group, our own peer group on farm research network back in 2018, based in the Red River Valley and have facilitated over 250 field scale research trials over the past five years. Jennifer has obtained a Bachelor of Science degree, a Master's degree, as well as a Bachelor of Education degree, all from the University of Manitoba. She lives in St. Jean with Brunel and their four daughters. So take it away, Jennifer. Right on. Thanks, Matt and Scott, for having me here this morning. And uh, I look forward to uh, giving a little uh, overview here from um, the Red River Valley. So I'll just bring this up. Everybody can see that, Matt? Yes, Scott? Yeah, we can see your presentation. Excellent. Okay, so as uh, Matt had mentioned, I'm Jennifer Sabrin. I, along with my husband, Brunel, we own and operate Antero Agronomy Services. We are based in St. Jean, Manitoba, so we're in the southern Red River Valley. So a lot of the information that I'm going to be presenting today is from that specific area. So just bear in mind that, you know, if you're, you know, out of province or, you know, farther away from us that, you know, obviously weather conditions are going to differ. So <laughs> I may not, uh, you know, I'm, I'm talking to what I, I experienced here in the Red River Valley. So um, essentially what I'm going to do is I've, I've just taken the, the four major commodity groups and I'm just going to do a little overview of some of the challenges that we've seen and uh, well, well, just some of the yields and things like that that we've seen over the last couple of years during this dry uh, cycle, uh, some of the diseases and weeds uh, that are, you know, the most uh, prevalent this time of year or in these cycles, I should say, and then, you know, just insect pests that, uh, you know, that we're always on the lookout for, those that might be uh, in elevated numbers due to the drought. So I've put the cereals together. So wheat, barley, and oats here in Manitoba or like in the Southern Red River Valley, you know, we are seeing yields that can be as low as like, you know, single digits, but then we can also see them slightly above average. So, you know, a typical agronomist answer is, you know, if you say, well, what's the, what are my yields going to be? Or what's the disease pressure going to be like? Or what's this going to be like? We always kind of answer, it depends, because it really does depend on the weather that we end up getting. So uh, what we have seen, though, recently is um, dry conditions in spring. So what we're seeing is often a lot of uneven emergence, and that is leading to um, issues throughout the rest of the season. So these cereals, they're going to set their, their yield at five to six leaf. The head is still in the ground. So if we have... Um, stress from from lack of moisture already the plant is going to sense that so it may not set as big of a head so which could then reduce yield. Um, also with our seeding if we don't have enough moisture in the soil we could have seeds that just don't germinate they're just caught in the dry. They may emerge later after a rain which then we, we will actually have like two crops in one field which is not <laughs> it's not easy to manage whatsoever. Um, weeds, we can see weeds that are, we have lower weed pressure because those seeds aren't germinating either. Um, however, if we have a thinner stand, what we can also see is that 
Uh, weeds can become quite an issue because we don't have as much competition from the crop itself. And, and then, you know, we have competition with the weeds for all the nutrients that we do have in the soil meant for the crop. When we take a look at spraying any of our in-season crop protection products, having an uneven crop makes it very difficult to time things properly. So if we're looking for fungicide application, for example, if the crop is not all at the same stage, we'll be too early for some parts of the field and we'll be too late for others uh, and perfect for, for some. So that can make things very difficult as well. And then at harvest is the same thing. If we don't have a crop that's even when, we, when it comes to harvest, we can have a lot of green seeds. Uh, and if we wait too long for certain areas to, to dry down and like ripen off, then what we're gonna see is we could have like a lot of shelling or we can have like just losses of uh, seeds being left in the field. So some farmers, what they, they've been thinking or considering doing with these dry conditions is that they, they might wanna bump up seeding rate just to try and make sure that we actually get a uh, you know, certain plant stand because we want to make sure that, you know, we're going to hit our optimum, optimum meal. But with that, with this, if it is dry, we are seeing a lot of seeds that are not germinating and uh, just because they're caught in the dry. Um, again, as I mentioned, uh, really like our, our yields, I mean, most farmers have a very good, laid, well laid out plan ready for the season. Uh, but mother nature, she's always going to have, throw us that curveball and she's always going to have the final say as to, you know, where the rain falls and when it falls and in what quantities we, we get, right? So, um, your available moisture for your crop is always going to be the biggest variable and, uh, that's, what's going to really dictate the rest of or your yield and like the, the entire crop season. One benefit, I guess, we could see with lower rain amounts, so this drought cycle that we've been in, is that we have been seeing lower uh, disease pressure. So well, when we see years that we have a lot of disease, so we'll take Fusarium head blight, for example, um, in wheat, if we have a nice thick stand, the canopy is closed, we get frequent rains, that lower canopy doesn't dry off and it allows you know mushrooms and spores to develop and then when your wheat head is is flowering if those spores are there then we can have infection and so that's when we want to be able to be applying our our fungicides for optimum use so if our crop isn't even we're not applying to protect the the heads at the optimum time and then you know we're we're not just we're just not being very efficient However, with that said, so that's in, we want to be able to save spray because then we know that we have a really good crop to protect. Um, we haven't had to worry about that the last few years because the, the crop in certain areas has been okay, but in other areas it's been a lot thinner. So air movement can move through uh, the lower canopy, keeping things dry. So therefore we don't have that spore production and therefore no, no uh, disease pressure. Uh, no moisture though also means lower yields and we haven't seen much lodging the varieties are getting shorter and shorter but also with the lack of moisture we're just not seeing the plant is not putting as much growth and energy into uh vegetative like plant material it's just it's just saying okay let's hurry up let's just finish off this um you know this plant and let's get as much into the head that we pause into the seeds as we possibly can so like I mentioned, uh, a couple of the diseases that we do tend to look for in, uh, in wheat um, and uh, some of the leaf uh, diseases in uh, the other cereals. So we've got Fusarium head blight and then tan spot. Tan spot we, so Fusarium we haven't seen very much of um, in the last uh, couple of years. Some areas, yes, we, you know, we have had to, to spray um, depending on those rains. And uh, the tan spot though, we do tend to see that more often. Um, typically we just see it in the lower leaves and the lower canopy. What we do um, when we're concerned and when we will, you know, look at uh, protection is when we start to see the disease moving up in the canopy in the upper leaves. Because it's those those last few leaves, including your flag leaf, 
that those are your powerhouses for the plant. So if those ones are affected by diseases, then you're not going to be able to photosynthesize and generate as much nutrients for filling those seeds than you are otherwise would. But again, we haven't really had to uh, worry about that too, too much the last few years. And uh, here are some of my not so favorite uh, little friends. Um, so cereal armyworms, they, uh, they will climb up the stems and they'll clip heads. If you do have lodge crop, they are often found underneath there where they don't have to do as much work. They can just crawl along and then, you know, eat the, eat the plant that is laid over on the ground. Uh, wheat midge, it's those little, they look like red, like large red mosquitoes, but they lay their eggs um, by the, uh, by the seeds and they, uh, they want the, the larvae are going to feed off of the developing seed. So they're, they're in there and they're, they're damaging the seeds. Cereal aphids, they're going to be in there right by the seeds as well. Again, we haven't had to worry about, we haven't seen an abundance of any of these. However, grasshoppers, those have been a major pest the last few years. They really do enjoy the dry cycle and uh, their numbers have been uh, increasing quite significantly, uh, especially here like in the Red River Valley. And so they will, you can see that's an adult grasshopper on the head. So they'll eat the seeds. They can also clip the heads. And uh, so as soon as that head drops to the ground, like that's lost yield. So uh, grasshoppers are definitely, definitely a problem. So now moving on to canola. Uh, the last couple of years, you know, we've seen, we've seen yields anywhere from 10 bushels an acre all the way up to above 50 bushels an acre again where that rain fell and if it was timely it uh it was very beneficial um we've seen increased acres being uh, seeded in the last few years but that's likely due to the fact that we have farmers that are shifting acres away from soybeans which are very uh they're the higher moisture crops and, uh, and late season moisture is often beneficial for them. So we're seeing a bit of a shift there, but commodity prices are also helping with, uh, with as, or playing a factor in, uh, in decisions as to which, which fields get seeded to which crop. Um, here in the Red River Valley, we're, we see a lot of our uh, canola fields being planted. And uh, so we are seeing like a, a, a reduction in seeding rates uh, we do have to be careful with that because if we have dry conditions, we won't have even emergence. Uh, and then if you're already reducing some of your, your, your seeding rates and then we don't get that plant stand, we are really putting ourselves in a position where we may not have enough of a stand to hit our maximum yield. You know, according to the Canola Council, we want to have five to seven plants per square foot minimum number of plants we want to have is three per square foot in order to hit our, our targeted yield. If we're below that, then we could be sacrificing yield. So um, we are seeing that. And then we also have to be careful that as we are using a planter, those, I mean, they're not considered narrow rows. Like this, the narrow, the narrowest we can get at this point with planters is a 15 inch row. Um, 15, 20 inches, pretty common in our area to plant on but if you compare that to someone who uses a drill who's on either seven and a half or ten inch rows what's happening is the the canopy is taking longer to close on our 15 or 20 inch rows which can give weeds more of a chance to establish between the rows and then that'll compete again for for uh, nutrients against the the canola um also when we have um, wider rows, so the 15 and 20 inch versus the seven and a half or 10 inch drill spacing. We are having more seeds within a row and we can see more in row competition. So if we have dry season, we, we tend to see more comp, like the plants, our yields are going to suffer because we have more seeds in that row and they're, they're not, um, they don't have as much access to moisture. So um, that might be beneficial to have like the, the narrow rows, but when we take a look at yields overall, 
it doesn't, we don't see a difference um, in, in, in our yields based on your, on your row spacing. What we are seeing is if we have a lack of moisture, we're just, I mean, canola so loss, it, it will grow, the plant will grow to the area that it's given and to the, the nutrients and moisture that it's, it has available to it. So we really want to maximize that, uh, that aspect of it. Um, also, what we've noticed is when we seed our canola very early on in the season, sometimes that so that canola can germinate but if it turns colder it that that plant can sit sit there and then it's susceptible to either diseases like in the soil so we could have like wire stem diseases or if the plant has germinated and then it's just sitting at cotyledon stage then we have an issue where flea beetles can come and attack because a, a canola plant has to get to see the three to four leaf before it can outgrow a flea, the flea beetle pressure. So we want to make sure that it is getting to that point. And it really does stall out if we have really cool temperatures and, uh, and if it's being attacked by flea beetles, that stress will slow it down as well. So if we have warmer temperatures, so if we wait a little longer, you know, say like towards the end of that first week of May, then we can, we tend to see better emerges and just, more rapid growth by the plants. And then we don't seem to have to worry too, too much about flea beetles. <clears throat> Lately, we have been seeing very high temperatures in the, the flowering stage of canola. So we are noticing a lot of flowers are being aborted. And so that is a loss in yield. Uh, you know, that's where we, you know, sometimes we try to get our canola planted earlier so that it's flowering outside of the highest, you know, temperature days that, uh, in summer. But um, we have to kind of offset that with early season stresses versus, you know, the later season stresses of, you know, having very high temperature days. Uh, I believe like over 25 degrees, like a canola plant really doesn't like that. So when we're hitting 30 30 degrees or more, we're going to have uh, aborted, aborted flowers. Um, when we're taking a look at uh, disease pressure in canola, we need to think about the amount of other crops, the diversity of crops that we have in our rotation and the, the amount of space that we leave between consecutive canola crops. Um, I'm going to mention in a minute a couple of the diseases that are soil borne that are, you know, stealing, like they're robbing yield from us. And it's because their levels, canola is being grown too close together on the same field. And we're starting to have a buildup of those, of those uh, pathogens in the soil. So we need to be cognizant of that. Another thing that does happen is with it being dry early in the season, we're gonna get our herbicides on before the canopy closes. So we don't wanna, we wanna drive over as little amount of crop as possible. Um, with that said though, sometimes after we get um, a bigger rain, we can see a flush of, of weeds. And last year we saw quite a bit of lambs quarters that uh, you know flushed after we had done our, our herbicides. And so that was, a bit of an ice whore throughout this season, but um, we also have to now keep that in the back of our mind that we have a weed seed bank in that in that field of lambs quarters, and uh, you know we're going to have to take a look at how to manage that going forward. And lastly, I just wanted to mention that we are starting to see way more resistant weeds showing up. Maybe for us because we're so close to the border, we're right by the river. You know, we tend to have more seasonal floods. Uh, we might be the ones that see these resistances showing up before some other areas of the province. But um, we definitely have to keep that in mind when we're choosing our different varieties, um, what chemical options we're leaving ourselves, um, and if they're going to be effective on the weeds that you have in that field. We have to get away from a one size fits all. Um, all my canola is going to get sprayed with this because we have to look at a per field basis. Um, this is just a picture of the canola field that had the lambs quarters escape. So this 
you know, this producer, you know, sprayed his herbicides, but they, the weeds flushed afterwards. Uh, just quickly here, uh, black leg is one of the big diseases that we have in canola. And often you don't, you don't see it until it's too late. So we have, you know, spores that develop on the infected residue from the previous season. And what, when it rains, like the spores splash up. And if we've had hail or there's any kind of um, frost damage on the plant, that's where like these spores can get in and then they can start to infect the plant. And you can see the disease severity scale here. So zero, obviously great, healthy canola plant. As we go through one all the way to five, we are losing 17 and a half percent of our yield as we shift in this scale. So it doesn't take long for the severity to, or for this disease to cut off like the, the, the stem. And so then we, we don't have the nutrients flowing. So that's one that we need to be aware of. And uh, we can, it, it's through the, uh, the, the spores, like the fungus on, on residue. So if we leave canola, like if we put like three years between consecutive canola fields, we should be able to, uh, those spores will have died. Like the fungus cannot maintain itself. It won't survive. So we should be okay. If we have it year after year, then we could be building up our uh, pathogen load. Another one that I wanted to mention that has, uh, we've been sending samples off to the lab in the last few years is verticillium stripe. It's soil borne. So it lives there in your soil. And essentially you don't really notice it until um, often at harvest, you'll take a look at well, those stems look really weird. Or you may have noticed in your field that an area is just ripening off and it can, it'll kill, it can kill off half of your stem. So half your plant is still green and alive. The other half is, is dead and it does survive in for many years, like in our, in our soils. So that's something to keep in mind. And it'll reduce your seed size and your oil content. So not only are we dealing with, you know, spores that are produced annually, um, we also have soil-borne uh, pathogens. Lastly, we have here are some of the insects that we always have to keep uh, keep an eye out for. So ligus bugs, cutworms, flea beetles, and diamondbacks. I just want to mention, like last year, diamondbacks weren't a problem in some of the um, some of the areas we had very strong south winds they don't overwinter they fly up they catch a ride on the southern winds and last year this was a, a pest that we did have to spray for uh, flea beetles it is a typical uh, insect that we we have to spray for in the in the spring ligus it's later on um, when we're dealing with uh, when we're dealing with the when it's flowering uh, grasshoppers as well. Just wanted to mention that the populations have really exploded. In this picture here, I'm not sure how well you guys can see it at home, but there are 24 females all laying eggs at this moment. And all these little holes that you see are where the females had already uh, laid some eggs. And up here towards the top by the residue there, there's a couple of black uh, field crickets. Those are natural predators. They're in there. They're trying to well, they're going down and having breakfast or lunch, um, but these will overwinter. They can survive our cold, cold temperatures and frozen ground. They can survive through a flood. Um, this is one of my most hated uh, insects because they do survive and we'll see their babies next year. Um, here's an example. It's one of the worst examples I've had but this is a video that I took uh, mid-August last year. So every one of these females can lay up to about 100 eggs throughout the season. And yeah, our cold winters don't kill them off. So we definitely have to make sure that we're, we're on, top of their, uh, um, on top of their populations. Uh, just really quickly here, soybean production, as I mentioned, we, they do like late, well, they like moisture, a lot of moisture and uh, especially late season to fill those top pods. So we've been seeing, you know, 20 to 40 bushel per acre um, yields. They do take longer to mature. So they do like those late season rains and um, 
<clears throat> so yeah, if we don't see those those later rains, we definitely see a reduction in yields. And that's where canola has been taking over some of those, those acres. Um, when we are in a, a short or a lack of moisture, the soybeans are, are shorter and they make it much more difficult to, to harvest and pick up those lower pods. We, as I mentioned, soybean uh, aphids or soybean aphids uh, have not been a problem since about 2016, um, but we always keep an eye out for those. And um, what we have been seeing though in these dry cycles is uh, root diseases, quite a bit of uh, root diseases showing up. So here's an example. This is a bacterial blight. This is common. Um, there's nothing that we do for that. This soybean cyst nematode, you can see all these little white uh, cysts. Those are the, that's the, the nematodes. Whereas uh, that larger, more pinky, um, no, that's one of the nodes. So that's what we want the roots to look like. So this plant has been quite infested. And then these other two pictures show Fusarium root rot and like Phytophthora. Um, so you can see how like the roots and the stem just start to die off. Here's just a picture of the aphids. Uh, soybean gullmage, these red little worms is something that uh, has been identified in the northern uh, North Dakotas. So it's not anything that we've known, we found here in Manitoba yet, but we are keeping an eye out for it. Um, so yeah, the the gullmage lays their eggs in the stem and then they, they start to eat. When they hatch, they eat the, uh, um, the stem. And grasshoppers. Grasshoppers are also, again, major, major pests in soybeans. As are spider mites and cutworms. Cutworms obviously are their early season. Spider mites we haven't seen in a while. They do um, you know, come up from the States as well. But that's not anything that we had to deal with in the last few years. Now my last few slides here, just on corn production. I know um, this might just be um, in the lower area of Manitoba where we where we have more heat units. But again, these are the you know longer season uh, varieties. Have last year because we did some late season rains. We were the guys that had some later uh, varieties. They were able to take advantage of those of those rains and they got like a 10 or 20 bushel bump compared to some of the earlier uh, season or the earlier maturing varieties. And uh, this last year, we really noticed that the hot weather affected the, and the, the drought stress affected pollination. So these plants, because there was a lack of moisture, they were just rushing to get done. And so we were noticing that they were tasseling before the cobs were even there, the silks weren't really out. So the timing was totally off for pollination. And like just a quick note, like every one of the silks is linked back to every one of the, the seeds. So if the pollen doesn't fall from the tassel and hit the silks, then those particular um, seeds don't get fertilized. And then you have incomplete, incomplete uh, pollination, which then reduces your yield extremely quickly. Um, this year it was, everything came off really dry because it, it was a pretty dry, dry year was last year. Um, the, the farmers had to, you know, put a lot of their corn through, through the dryers to bring that moisture down. And, uh, it seemed to, well, this year they just were able to, to save some money because the plants dried down naturally in the field. So here's some of the diseases that uh, we look for, but aren't really a big issue up here because we don't grow corn on corn on corn on corn. We have a good rotation. So um, Goss's wilt has a lot of, uh, the varieties are really good uh, resistance for that, common rust and then leaf blight. This is a picture of the uh, un or the incomplete fertilized or pollinated uh, cobs. We saw a lot of those this past year, and that's just because the the plant was the timing was totally off for its for its um, pollination. And then finally, this is uh, some of the 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 insects that we take a, uh, that we're scouting for with. Uh, with corn. Uh, cutworms is one of the bigger ones that we're looking for. The European corn borer, most of the varieties are um, BT, like they are uh, resistant to the corn borer. And then we'll also watch for, for wireworms. But um, 
like I said, because we have a pretty wide um, uh, rotation, we don't seem to have too, too many uh, issues, uh, thankfully, at this point in, in our corn. So I want to thank Scott and Matt again for the opportunity to talk with everybody today. And if you want to get a hold of me, you can send me an email or you can you know, find me on Twitter. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, Jen. That, was, that great. was great. And just and a reminder so for anyone that has any questions, feel free to post them in the chat and the conversation box, and we'll answer them after Scott's presentation here. So we'll uh, quickly move on here to Scott's presentation uh, about prairie climate uh, this past year. Uh, Scott is the president and chief scientist of WeatherLogix. He attended the University of Manitoba, where he completed both his bachelor's and master's degrees in meteorology. In his current role as chief scientist at WeatherLogix, Scott conducts weather research and develops tools to help clients plan for all types of weather conditions. This includes new methods to improve weather prediction and the analysis of past weather events. Despite his focus on research, uh, Scott still enjoys day-to-day -day forecasting and is often involved in preparing high impact or preparing for high impact events. So I'll hand it over to Scott here. Thanks, Matt, and thanks, uh, Jen, for your talk. I'll, uh, Matt, if there's any problem, just let me know. But I think uh, the slides are up. Yeah. We so can I'm. Looking forward to talking with you today a bit about prairie climate. Uh, over the past number of years, the dry weather has been a big concern. And beyond that, just understanding what is normal in our climate is important for planning how you're going to attack any given year. So the things I'll talk about today are what's normal in terms of temperature and precipitation, the drought of last year, recent trends that are showing possible changes in climate over time and the, the forecasting that WeatherLogix does. So firstly, what is normal weather? You probably heard the term today's normal high is X or today this month's normal rainfall is Y. But what does normal mean? Really normal is just an average. What we do is take the last 30 years of weather data, average it out, and that is what normal is. The reason we use 30 years is because Climatologists feel that is the period of time you need in order to kind of get a representative average of um, what a, an area's climate is at a given point in time. Uh, climate is not static. It does change over time, sometimes more quickly than others. But 30 years is kind of the generally accepted period for representing our current climate. And so these uh, normal values are updated every 10 years. So you'll often hear the 19... Uh, 81 to 2010 normals are, are this. Currently, we're moving toward the 1991 to 2020 normals, incorporating the past three decades uh, as we update that. So firstly, what are temperature normals? Well, here's a map showing winter temperature normals across the prairies. You can look at the map and the redder, uh, oops, the redder colors are, um, the warmer temperatures on average and the uh, bluer colors are colder. So you'll see that across the prairies, at least in wintertime, Southern Alberta is the warmest. Uh, normal meet average temperature is just below freezing. And then in Northern Manitoba is the coldest well into the minus 20. So roughly uh, winter temperatures decrease from west to east across the prairies. And here on the side, I've listed what normal highs are in the month of January. So in Winnipeg, it's minus 11, Regina minus 9, Calgary minus 1. And precipitation for uh, the month of January, fairly similar across all three cities, but um, Winnipeg is a little bit snowier than areas to our west. In July and summer in general, the pattern kind of reverses. Actually, Alberta is the coolest with the exception maybe of the far southeast corner around Medicine Hat. And then southern Manitoba is the warmest. Saskatchewan is kind of in between. So the Red River Valley of Manitoba is probably the, the area of the prairies with the warmest average temperature in the summertime. Uh, and then areas of southern Saskatchewan, southeastern Alberta aren't that much cooler, but a little bit. And precipitation in summer is quite a bit higher. Uh, Winnipeg is the highest, 76 millimeters, Regina 59, 
Calgary 66. And I'll show precipitation maps in a moment, but there are quite dramatic differences in precipitation normals across the prairies uh, in different areas. So like I, I showed on the previous slide, I've um, listed here on the side what the normals are for January and July. But for the year as a whole, this map shows what normal precipitation is. So in southeastern Manitoba, that's the wettest part of the prairies where you might expect at least some agriculture, although um, it is fairly forested down there, but there's a little bit. Um, down there, you get almost uh, 26 inches per year on average, uh, 660, 630, 660 millimeters. Contrast that with southeastern Alberta around Medicine Hat or Brooks, where you're all the way down to maybe only 12, 11, 12, 13 inches a year on average. So almost um, half as much in southeastern Alberta as southeastern Manitoba. And then if you kind of just follow roughly from the Saskatchewan Alberta border to the uh, Manitoba Ontario border, you can see you know, roughly precipitation increases gradually across the prairies. It's not totally uniform. There are some local maximums like along the Riding Mountains and some of the higher terrain of western Manitoba, also Cypress Hills, there's a little bit of a maximum and, and so on. But uh, overall, it's kind of a west to east increase in precipitation. But what about the growing season? So that previous map was for the year as a whole. Growing season follows a fairly similar trend because the bulk of our precipitation occurs during the warm season, so sort of May through October, let's say, or April through October. And because Manitoba is was the wettest um, for the year as a whole, it makes sense that it was it's also the wettest during the growing season. So you can see in the southeast corner of Manitoba, uh, looking at close to 14 inches just from April through July. And then in Alberta, in the southeast, only you know six to eight inches of of rain during the April to July period. And again, it roughly increases from west to east with some variations, but there is quite a dramatic difference in uh, rainfall across the prairies. So if you're in southeastern Alberta, you're probably either irrig irrigating to um, grow certain types of crops or you're planting crops that can handle drier weather. Whereas if you're in Manitoba, you're probably anticipating that you're going to get rain and so we don't see as much irrigation usually in, in that area. So let's talk about the drought a little bit. And firstly, let's define what drought means. There's actually a lot of complexity to drought because it's really about impacts. But just in general, the term drought is referring to a period of abnormally dry weather. Um, and the definition goes on to say it's sufficiently long to create a serious hydrological imbalance, which basically is referring to the fact that more moisture is leaving the ground that is uh, repl being replaced, but we won't uh, dwell on that too much. What I'm really going to talk mostly about is agricultural drought, but beyond that, there's three other kind of subcategories which are sometimes used to categorize drought or or refer to drought. One is meteorological drought, which is purely a statistic. So, for example, you might say Saskatoon received 150 millimeters less rain than normal in a year. That doesn't really mean anything if if um, your crop still did well under those conditions, it's purely statistical. Some years that might be a really bad thing, other years it might not matter as much. Agricultural drought is really just talking about the impact on agriculture. So um, it's basically if, if there was insufficient moisture for crops, there'd be crop failure and that would be an agricultural drought. Hydrological drought is more referring to our water resources like rivers or lakes. In 2021, the Red River in southern Manitoba almost dried up. Places south of Winnipeg, you could basically cross it on foot or there was very little water uh, in there, so it was not difficult to cross it. And that would be an example of a hydrological drought. Socioeconomic is the impact on society. So it might be, um, you know, farmers are spending less on inputs because crops are doing badly. That affects the economy or there's food shortages due to agricultural failures, which impacts society. So it's really all about impacts, and that's what makes drought so complicated. Because just if there's less rain or snow than normal in a given year, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be negative for agriculture. If you had a super wet year in 2021, you might not mind a little bit drier weather in 2022 if your soil 
already is charged up and ready to go for the year. If you had another really wet year in 2022, it might actually flood and might be a bad thing. So a little bit drier could be okay. On the other hand, um, last year was pretty dry for most people. So another dry year this year would be even worse probably than uh, the dryness last year or the year before. So just as a kind of example, you can Im imagine, especially for producers who experienced flood conditions earlier in um, this, this uh, century, early 2000s, um, if you had five really, really wet years in a row, then you probably are actually hoping for a drier sixth year, as long as your soil um, can hold some moisture, because um, those five really wet years have given you plenty, plenty of moisture to work with, and you need drier weather so that you can actually work your fields and, and grow crops in that sixth year. Drought's also very relative because in Alberta, as I showed, 300 millimeters or 12 inches of rain or precipitation a year might be normal and is for, for some farmers in the southeast. In a place like Illinois, where a lot of corn is grown, 300 millimeters in a year would be disastrous because normally in Illinois, they get 1,000 millimeters per year and they're counting on that to grow a lot of corn. In a place like Manitoba, we also grow corn, but a thousand millimeters would be a flood disaster. We've never had that much uh, precipitation in a year, and just because of our geography, that would be horrible from a flood perspective. So it's just more examples to show that for farmers, really all that matters is agricultural drought, and whether or not there's agricultural drought is basically just dependent on whether there's moisture at the right time. Do you have moisture in that critical window, kind of spring and into summer, when the crop is growing. If you've got the right moisture at that time, you'll be fine. The year as a whole could be dry, could be wet, um, but it's really just that one period and that's um, whether or not we would have an agricultural drought. So as far as the 2021 drought goes, this map is for pretty much the entire warm season. So from early April to the end of October. And there were a few areas that were super dry. So around Saskatoon and West Central Saskatchewan, super dry. Um, a large part of Alberta was fairly dry as well. Uh, was, you know, the, the southern part of Alberta is normally dry to begin with, but it wasn't. Um, it was uh, especially dry last year. Then in uh, places like eastern and, and southeastern Saskatchewan into western Manitoba and even through other parts of Manitoba, it was quite variable because early in the year it was very dry, but then quite a bit of rain arrived later in the year, so August and into the fall. So the map is a bit deceiving in that sense because it's for that entire time period. Um, but for a lot of farmers during that critical spring, early summer window, it was quite dry and, and the, the rain only arrived when it was too late for a lot of people. So here are graphs showing precipitation for select cities. So I'll do one slide for each province, starting with Alberta. This graph is showing with the, the bar graph is showing the precipitation each month, and the line is showing the cumulative over the course of, of the entire April to October period. The star shows what's normal in July. So in Calgary in July, according to the line graph, there had been almost 150 millimeters since April, but normal up from April through July was just over 250. So this line is below the star, and therefore that, that's indicating it was drier than normal from April through July. And every single graph here, you see the same thing. The star is above the, the graph. So there was below normal precipitation. If you look at Lethbridge, for example, they only get around 200 millimeters normally from April through July, but last year they didn't even get 100. So very dry down there. Lloydminster also a, a drier area, less than 200 millimeters April through July and, and so on. Moving to Saskatchewan, interesting one actually Regina, because you can see here up till July, they were not too far from normal, but then there was this big bump here in August. Uh, the line shot up pretty quickly because August was a wet month with over 100 millimeters of precipitation. So it was actually wetter than normal in, in August. Saskatoon, on the other hand, was not so fortunate later in the year. They did not get much in the way of moisture early in the summer or later in the summer. So you can see by July only 100 millimeters, whereas normally they would have had 200. And actually for the entire year, Saskatoon only had about 180 millimeters of precipitation, 
which is crazy dry. That's even drier than um, parts of southern Alberta. So it was a really devastating year around Saskatoon, west central Saskatchewan. And Yorkton, Swift Current also quite dry, as you can see. Swift Current, uh, not too different from Saskatoon in terms of numbers. Uh, Manitoba story continues, really. Uh, every location was below normal in terms of rain from April through July. Uh, Winnipeg is one of the wetter parts of the prairies, normally getting 250 plus millimeters April through July, and they only had uh, just over 100 by that period of time. Brandon, not too different, and uh, Morden actually also probably even a touch wetter than Winnipeg normally, and they were quite dry, only about 100 millimeters through July, normally more like 260, 270. Dauphin, uh, very similar as well. So every station I've shown here on the prairies was below normal April through July. And you might find the odd one that was above normal, but pretty much everybody, it was the same thing. It was just how dry were you? So what about recent trends? We obviously know that it's been really dry the past number of years. But in terms of these trends, I'm looking at a lot longer period of time than that. I'm looking at about the last 65 years. So we're talking about more long-term changes in our climate. The past five years, I think you could probably relate more to weather patterns. It's starting to get, when you're talking about five years and, and longer, that is more of a climate discussion in, in a lot of ways, but this is really long-term stuff. So if you look at the last 65 years on the prairies as a whole, very little change in precipitation, nothing really significant. No change in extreme heat in the summertime. It's pretty much flatlined. We do see a slight increase in our growing season length of about 10 days on average and about 95 more growing degree days on average. In terms of more uh, significant changes in temperature, winters are getting quite a bit warmer. There's less freezing days and less um, extreme cold days in winter. So the probably the if you were to point to one major change in our climate past 65 years, it would be warmer winters and slightly longer growing seasons. But as a you know, in general, summer conditions haven't changed much. Um, pretty much the same precipitation and, and same uh, type of heat. Now moving on to um, the dry cycle that we're currently in. I thought I'd just highlight one location, Saskatoon, but you could highlight an, any number of locations. Winnipeg wouldn't look much different than this, or um, even in recent years, some parts of Alberta have turned drier. So um, the dry cycle that I'm talking about has probably affected the eastern prairies more than the west, but last year was quite dry in the west uh, as well, place most of Alberta. So a lot of the stuff may begin to apply more and more to Alberta as well. But if we look back historically, the prairies do experience, um, I wouldn't say frequent, but dry cycles on fairly um, consistent intervals. So the 1930s, of course, were a major dry period. The 80s were a dry period. And in the western prairies, the early 2000s were a very dry period. On the other hand, we also have wetter periods. So in, in the east, um, the late 90s, early 2000s were quite wet. We remember washout years in Manitoba like 04 and 05. So these types of patterns do tend to re repeat over time. The dry cycles or wet cycles tend to last 10 to 20 years on average. That doesn't mean that every single year in that 10 or 20 year period will be wet or dry, but on the whole, that's the trend. And so Saskatoon really illustrates that. This is the past 10 years. Every year with a red bar showing um, below normal precipitation, the larger the red bar, the more below normal it was. So if you look at since 2011, really only 2012 was wetter than normal. 2014 was pretty much right on normal and every other year was dry. So this is a pretty good example of a dry cycle. Not every year was dry, but clearly the trend is very dry overall. And because we've been in this dry cycle since roughly 2011 in the eastern prairies, it could technically break at any time because the cycles last 10 to 20 years. But on the other hand, it could last another uh, 10 years. These cycles, based on the research we've done so far, seem to be based mostly on temperatures in the Pacific Ocean. And because ocean temperatures change so slowly, uh, these patterns don't like to change very quickly. So finally, just want to talk a little bit about some of the work we do to help farmers. Uh, a number of you use our forecast subscriptions. So what we do with that 
is we send farmers an email every morning with a forecast for their location and a discussion about the upcoming trends in, in the weather pattern. Uh, we also have an app which is showcased here on the side, which you have access to. It gives you all of it gives you your forecast for your location, but also lots of other stuff like uh, current conditions at a weather station close to you, um, weather radar, all sorts of weather maps, um, and uh, you know more graphs, tables, and so on. So there's lots of stuff in the app that you can look at as well. Our forecasts are made by our meteorologists, uh, myself and Matt primarily. We're here on the prairie, so we know the weather very well. Some of the things we include in these daily forecasts are uh, a daily uh, detailed weather outlook, which is written and describes the upcoming weather for the area. Then a detailed five-day forecast for your location, talking about pretty much anything you need, temperature, wind, rain, snow, humidity. Um, we even do things like, uh, you know, for windy days like today in Manitoba, blowing snow or um, road conditions. Long range forecast for the next 16 days is included. We have maps like the one here showing wind, temperature, uh, rain for the local area so that you know what's uh, going to be happening over a larger spatial area. Uh, we also send out special weather updates when major storms are happening. And in our app, like I said, you can get radar, weather stations, highway conditions, and, and a lot of other stuff too. So some of you I, who are here I know are, are already subscribers. So I thought I'd announce a few things that we're doing new for this year. Uh, so one new thing will be that uh, starting in spring, we'll be doing forecasts every day, uh, including Sunday. We, we used to not include Sunday, but we will be starting this year. We'll also be including a daily summary showing the temperatures and rain at your location the previous day. So we've developed some new technology that allows us to identify how much rain fell at different locations, even without rain gauges. So we're excited to show that. Uh, we'll be doing hail mapping for you. So you'll see a map similar to this showing any hail that happened in your area the previous day so that you can go out and scout that immediately. And uh, more longer term forecasts. So we're going to provide more regular updates showing what's expected for the next few months rather than just for the next week or two. And also many improvements to our app. So if you haven't checked out the app lately, uh, be sure to do that because there's so much that's changed. We are pushing new updates every two weeks and um, our development team has worked very hard on that the past year. So it's quite different than the first time you would have logged in. So if you're interested, just visit our website, weatherlogics.com, and click Agriculture. If you want to try it first, there's a free trial available. You can sign up right there, and we'd be happy to talk to you about it. So feel free to check that out, and um, there's a contact page if you have more questions for us. So thanks uh, for joining us, and uh, I'm looking forward to taking any questions. Great. Thanks, Scott presentation there. If there's any questions, uh, just a reminder to post in the conversation chat of Microsoft Teams. Um, so I'll just start off with one question here uh, for Jen, maybe. So what do you expect uh, in terms of trends over the next year or so? So you, you've talked about lots of the past year. What about this upcoming year? What are the trends for pests and diseases? Right. Well, I mean, so far we, we have a lot more snow um, to date than we've seen in many of the past winters. So it's it's nice, but um, I don't think we're going to have a lot of moisture from that snow by the time that, you know, the soil melts and can absorb that whatever moisture is in that snow. So I don't think that uh, we can really rely on the snow that we're seeing to be, you know, our way out of any kind of you know, drought condition. Um, at this point, I still think that we need to err on the side of caution. We need to be very cognizant of our insects that we have, that we know those populations are ramping up and we have to take care of those. Plus also our, uh, the different weeds, especially like when we are in a drought, they tend to get a thicker, uh, the, leave, the cuticles on the leaves get thicker, which makes it even harder for in, uh, herbicides to, uh, penetrate and be effective against them. So we really have to make sure that we know, um, I, I think we have to err on the side of a drier cycle, um, but we can always be, you know, optimistic that, you know, maybe we're turning the corner into a slightly more normal uh, wetter cycle, but uh, uh, I, I would still keep it the same that we have been 
the last few years in terms of planting seeding rates. Uh, you know, probably most fertilizer has gone down just because it was so expensive last fall compared to what we're seeing already for spring. So, um, you know, we just, and, and if you are extremely dry, yeah, I, I don't foresee that this winter snow is going to alleviate any of that. Okay, good to know. Thanks, Jen. And a question just popped up here. Uh, what kind of info is available for farmers res with respect to disease and knowing how or when to treat the crop? Sure. Um, Manitoba Ag often has a lot of information posted on their website. And when you're getting into, uh, say, fungicide timing, they do have risk assessment maps that are updated daily because that is affected, like the, the previous 24-hour uh, weather and then the previous seven days of weather um, are all factored into it. So they are, those are updated frequently for us in our area and those uh, farmers that we work with, you know, when we're their agronomists, uh, we are constantly talking to the, the specialists over at Manitoba Ag. Um, and then, yeah, you just have to be walking the fields and assessing how, um, if you're seeing anything, any type uh, signs of disease and if your canopy is looking good, if the canopy looks good, be ready to spray. Okay. Yeah, a quick comment from me on that. Yeah. In our app, we have disease modeling for your location for things like Fusarium, Sclerotinia, uh, leaf rust, some other things as well, potato blight. So if you're interested, uh, make sure to check that out. Also, for if you're treating for disease, also in our app um, and with our service, we have a spray cast. So that shows you hour by hour what's going to be the wind speed. Is there an inversion present which can cause spray drift? And is the temperature and humidity appropriate for spraying? So there's guidelines for when it's appropriate to spray based on weather conditions. And you'll find that uh, as well if you're looking at the app. The app. Okay, thanks Scott and Jen. Uh, one more question here. Oh, there's another question in the chat. So we'll go to that one first. And in the meantime, I will pick a winner for the subscription prize that we had at the end of the chat. So the question was, this one's likely for Scott, are ocean surface temps warming or cooling? What is the relation to precipitation on the prairies? Well, ocean temperatures are always warming and cooling. There, there's different patterns that occur in the oceans. The most well-known one is El Nino or La Nina. So right now uh, in the Pacific, we have a La Nina event, which means the central Pacific near the equator is colder than normal. However, that's beginning to weaken, which means that the Central Pacific is slowly warming back up. But that's just one part of the oceans. There's other areas. And as far as um, your question about relation to precipitation goes, the research that I've read, which was done for pr the prairies, was linking mainly the North Pacific temperatures to our weather conditions. So I haven't looked recently at what the temperatures were in the North Pacific, but there, there is evidence to show that that particular part of the Pacific Ocean may be more important for our weather than um, for other people. So that's that's one thing I would watch. However, these connections are always very difficult to to pin down because that's just one factor. There's so many other factors, both in the oceans and the atmosphere, that would affect our weather beyond just that one. That one would probably govern more longer-term trends, but there's more short-term things, um, especially. Uh, at this time of year, things like uh, you know, whether the polar vortex in the Arctic is wobbling south, things of that nature can affect our weather dramatically too. But um, if there was one thing I would point to, it would be look at the North Pacific because that's the one thing that research has pointed to in the past. Great, thanks Scott. And uh, so the draw for the winner, uh, the name that was picked was Jamie Bell. So Jamie Bell will be in contact with you and thanks for attending. Um, otherwise, if, are there any other questions? If not, we will uh, close this webinar session. I'll just give it a, another 30 seconds here to see if there's any other questions. But if not, thanks everyone for coming. We'll have our next webinar uh, for the 2022 Summer Outlook, and that webinar will be presented in March. So uh, make sure to attend in March to see what the summer holds for us across the Canadian prairies. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you in March. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Thanks Jen again. You bet.